Well, praise the Lord, everyone. This is Mass Memorial CME Sunday School for August 18th, 2024, and I'm Sister Sharon. We're on our summer quarter, Hope in the Lord, Unit 3, Eternal Hope. Today's lesson, The Rules of Life. Our key verse comes from Titus, the second chapter, verses 11 through 13. And it says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our lesson scripture comes from Titus, the first chapter, verses one through three, and Titus, the second chapter, verses 11 through 15. Now let's do some background. So the writer of Titus is Paul. We know his Hebrew name was Saul. His Roman name was Paul. He was Jewish, but born a Roman citizen. He was born at Tarsus in Cilicia. He is a tent maker by trade, a Pharisee and a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, apostle to the Gentiles a defender and advocate of Christian faith. He wrote 13 letters presented in the New Testament. And so we, we know that um, Titus is one of those. And there are three great missionary journeys and we can see that in Acts. Now, just a little bit about Titus, we'll talk about him more, but just for a couple of bullet points, he was a Greek Gentile and we can see that in Galatians 2, 3. And also, Paul called him a true son in our common faith. And that's found in Titus 1, 4. So he was a spiritual son or a son in the ministry of Paul. Now, we are introduced to Titus by Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians 7, 5 through 7, it says, For when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, Conflicts on the outside, fears within. And you all might remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about when they were in Macedonia. Okay, so he's talking about that situation with the Corinthians. And then verse six says, but God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. So Titus came and he provided comfort for them. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me so that my joy was greater than ever. So basically, we have that Titus comes and he provides comfort just by his presence, but also just in his giving a report about the Corinthians and how much they um, longed for Paul. It goes on in 2 Corinthians in the 8th chapter, verse 6. 16 through 17 and verse 23a, and it says, so we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus, for he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. And then verse 23, if anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. So we see that Titus was with Paul uh, with the Corinthians, and then he stayed behind with the Corinthians for a while. And then also now we're going to see um, where he's headed. And that's where our lesson is. Now, the letters of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus are referred to as the pastoral epistles. So again, we talk about that Paul wrote 13 um, books of the Bible. And so these three are called the pastoral epistles or letters. And these three letters, and 1 Timothy and Titus were written about the same time between 63 and 66 AD. Okay, they were written by Paul to his two spiritual sons who were serving in pastoral roles within churches. Okay, so he wrote to Timothy and Titus approximately at the same time. Here's an excerpt from the Tony Evans study on Bible commentary, and it says, Titus was one of the apostle Paul's sons in the ministry. Paul sent him to lead the churches on the island of Crete. And then he wrote this brief letter to equip Titus to effectively lead them in serving the body of Christ. Paul explained to Titus 
the importance of leadership, noting that part of Titus's responsibility as a pastor and spiritual leader was to develop leaders who would help the church fulfill his role. This included encouraging the older men to disciple the younger men and the older women to disciple the younger women so that the members of the body of Christ could help one another grow. So again, Titus was one of Paul's sons in the ministry and his letter was written to help him um, in his role as pastor and as a spiritual leader to help e choose leaders, how to choose leaders, and then how they need to be equipped. Now, he was Titus was sent to Crete. And so here's a map so that we can see, um, we see where Corinth is, okay? And then you'll see that Crete is an island in the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, Crete is an island in the Mediterranean Sea. And it was supposed to have many cities. So one person said 100 cities, but they were thinking that they might have rounded that. But they know that this, it was at least 20 to 40 cities in Crete. Now, why was this a task, everybody? Because you're like, okay, you're going to go and minister to Crete. Here's why it was a task. Here's why this was um, a, a large um responsibility or large thing for um, Titus to do. There was a Cretan philosopher and poet named Epimenides, and he said, the Cretans, always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies. That's what he said. Now, this is a whole paradox about what he said, and I'm not going to go into it too much, but he was a Cretan, and then he basically called all Cretans liars. So if he called all Cretans liars, he was calling himself a liar. So then if he's a liar, then the statement that he made is also a lie, which then means that all Cretans must tell the truth. So they go, you can go back and forth and back and forth. But when he made this statement, um, just to know about this poet, he believed that Zeus, okay, remember the God, um, false gods, but the false god Zeus, he believed that the false god Zeus was immortal. And he was upset with, the, with Crete because they had basically... Um, did not think of Zeus as being um, immortal. They thought of him as being mortal, even though he was a god. They thought of him as being more mortal. And so that's when he said, Cretans are liars. But basically he's saying, Cretans are liars, evil beasts, that idle bellies means that they're lazy and they're gluttonous, okay? And so he makes this statement. Now, is this necessarily all the people on Crete? No, but this is their reputation, okay? And even their own people know it. You know, just think about, do we know about our own families, you know, what people say about people in our family, okay, or, you know, or where we live, you know, how they, how they look at where we live and make decisions about where we live. So that here, this philosopher and poet was talking about his own people, and he's the one that says, Cretans, always liars, okay, and so this is going to come up in the lesson, and it comes up, because I'm going to quote um, one of my um favorite verses, Numbers 23, 19, okay, because here this place is full of liars, okay, and now we've had this set of people who have turned, okay, it's the church, they've turned from, they've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, but they're living in the midst of a place that's full of liars, okay, and so the, we see this contrast when we talk about God, so Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, okay, so we know God doesn't lie, Okay, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do or has he spoken? He will not make it good. So this is that contrast between um, we want to live godly lives. We want to um, be holy as God is holy. And we know that God is not a liar. So it's like, but here this, this church or these churches are put into this society where the people lie all the time. Okay, but we need to not do what, society is doing, we need to do what God would have for us to do, okay? We need to follow what he tells us to do. So before the lesson, just to get a, give us a little bit more, so you'll see this statement, this is in Titus 1, 5 and 10 through 13. So our lesson actually is Titus 1, 1 through 3, but I need to go a little bit more into chapter 1. And it says, um, and so Paul's talking to Titus and he says, for this reason, I left you in Crete. Okay, that you should set in order the things that are lacking 
and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So in other words, there needed to be some structure in the churches. And so he left Titus in charge of that to set things in order. And those words set in order is the same as when you're fixing a broken bone. Okay. So in other words, if we think about something in that sense, then broken bone is not healthy. Okay. And so therefore we have to set it to make it correct. So same thing here, there was some unhealthiness, spiritual unhealthiness. And so he has Titus there to set things in order so that they will be correct. Okay. And that he needs to appoint elders. Now it goes through in chapter one and gives a description of what type of character, um, the elders should have. That's not actually a part of our lesson, okay? But that is in chapter one. Now, I'm going on to verses 10 through 13 because, again, he left them in Crete. And what's the issue with Crete? Here we go. It says, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. And we talked about those before, what that, so those are Judaizers, okay? And Judaizers were people who wanted to accept, who accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, but they were telling people, you have to have more than that. You have to become Jewish first, or you have to be circumcised first, okay? And so when they're talking about, especially those of the circumcision, we think a lot of times just of Jewish people of the circumcision, but it was also those who wanted Jesus Christ to be Savior and Lord, but they also were saying, everybody who, who accepts Jesus Christ has of men had to be circumcised. And so again, um, Paul is telling Titus, these are the issues you got. He says, you got many who are insubordinate, so they're, they're not obeying the, um, what they're supposed to, they're, they're not changing. They're, they're idle talkers, they're deceivers, okay? Especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not, for the sake of dishonest gain. So you have people teaching things, trying to get money. Okay, we can look at our society today and some people are doing things for the money, for the love of money. And then it says, one of them, a prophet of their own said, and that's um, Epimendus, okay? He said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, okay? This testimony is true, is what Paul is saying. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may sound in the faith. So he's not trying to be, um, he's, he's basically agreeing with something that they say about themselves. Or he's just saying, this is this culture. This is how this culture is known. He says, their own poet says this about them. So that's what you're dealing with. I understand what, you, that's what Paul's saying. Son, I understand what you're dealing with. I know I left you there, okay, in Crete to fix this. And I know what you're up against, okay, but God, right? And so he says, he says, but he also told them, you're going to have to rebuke them. You're going to have to correct them, okay, so that they'll become sound in the faith because they, you know, they can't have all this um, leaven or all this um, stuff that's not of God or not of Christianity getting into these new young believers, okay, and then leading them astray. And so he's like, they have to be rebuked sharply that they might be sound in their faith. Now, a little bit more background. We're just going to look at Titus 2, verse 1 and 7. And it says, but as for you, again, Paul speaking to Titus, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. So again, they need to be sound in the faith and Titus needs to speak sound doctrine. Verse seven says, in all things, and now he's talking about how are you behaving? He's talking to Titus. You've got to be on the up and up too. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. OK, so no, we're not saved by good works, he said, but your character is important. He said how you're living is important. Your day to day is important. Your integrity, your good works, your your reverence to God. OK, that you're not corruptible. OK, that your speech is sound. OK, remember, we talked about there. You are the only Bible some people are reading. 
Okay. And so therefore, when they look at you, are they reading the are they reading the true Bible? Okay, what the Bible says, or is it not sound? An excerpt from Charles Stanley's Life Principles Daily Bible says, sound doctrine does not refer merely to an accurate presentation of biblical data. Sound doctrine always has a practical application to godly living with either a positive emphasis where we exhort someone to, toward godly living or a negative one, convict, where how we act convicts someone of their behavior because their behavior is not godly. So again, sound doctrine is not just biblical data. It's also a practical application. Now we're to the lesson. So our lesson is Titus 1, 1 through 3 is the first part. And I'm going to quote this um, in New King James Version and in the Living Bible, because I believe it's more understandable in the Living Bible. But I'm going to go ahead and say it, um, read it to you in New King James Version. It says, Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness and hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandments of God our Savior. So first, before we look at it in the Living Bible, he says, Paul, a bondservant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, he says, I do this because I am submitted to God. I, this is not about me. Bond servant is like the lowest form of slavery. He's saying, I am, God is my master. Okay. He says, okay. He is Lord of all. He says, apostle, I'm a messenger for Jesus Christ. He said, it's not my message. It's Jesus message. Okay. And so that's where he starts off. Now, if we look at this in the living Bible, they actually use the word slave. It says, from Paul, the slave of God and the messenger of Jesus Christ. He says, I have been sent to bring faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know God's truth, the kind of truth that changes lives. Okay, we know the word says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Okay, we also know the word of God. If other verses, John 17, 17 says, sanctify us through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So he says, I'm here to teach basically the word of God, you know, the truth, okay, the kind of truth that changes lives so that they can have eternal life, which God promised them before the world began, and he cannot lie. So it's important when Paul is talking to Titus that he makes that statement, and God cannot lie. Because remember, Titus is dealing with a whole set of people who lie. Or a lot of people who lie. There's probably some honest people in there, but a whole lot of people who are, or at least known to be liars. So he's letting him know. God is going to do what God said he's going to do. God's going to do it in his timing. Okay. He promised it before the world began. It will be done because God cannot lie. Verse three says, and now in his own good time. Now in the living Bible, it says on good time. In the New King James Version, it says, in due time, I believe it's in the um, New International Version, it says, um, in the appointed time. And we're going to talk about that, but basically it says, and now in his own good time, he has revealed the good news, okay? And we know that good news is about our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, and permits me to tell it to everyone. By command of God, our Savior, I have been trusted to do this work for him. OK, so this is Paul in his introduction. He says, I am a slave and I am a messenger. I'm here to present God's truth and God's truth will change lives. OK, and God has promised um, us eternal life. OK, he promised that at the very beginning before the world began. And we know it's going to happen because God is God and God does not lie. Remember Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he has to repent. He says, and he's going to do that in God's timing, okay? And that's what it basically says in this um, excerpt from the Quest Bible called Appointed Season. 
It says, sometimes we understand God's timing. Other times we don't. Galatians 4.4, 4, 1 Timothy 6.15. Paul's point is that God always works according to his purpose. Always. So it's going to be in God's time. Okay. But it's going to be according to his purpose, inviting us to accept eternal life through Jesus Christ. So God promised it. You know how that's the saying says, God promised it. I believe it. That settles it. Well, really, God promised it. That settles it. We need to believe it, but it's already settled. Once God says it, it's settled. So it will happen in God's own good time or God's appointed season or in due time. Just like um, God brought Jesus Christ, there was a due season for Jesus to appear um, in Bethlehem, okay, it was a due season. It was God's timing for him to send his son, um, Jesus Christ. Now, Titus 2, 11 through 12 in our lesson says, now starts talking about grace. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So to define grace, sometimes we hear unmerited favor, okay? And so again, um, we couldn't save ourselves. Works don't save us. It was God's unmerited favor so that that, that brought salvation to us. Another definition that I've heard for grace is the ability to do with ease by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's not easy without the power of the Holy Spirit. The ability to do it is by the power of the Holy Spirit, what would otherwise be difficult. So in other words, first there's this unmerited favor that we have for salvation, that we're given this gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And then we're given this ability by the Holy Spirit to live godly lives to live righteously in right standing with God, to live soberly. And that word soberly or sober-minded, you'll see it throughout Titus, okay? That's saying, in a way, it's the same way when Paul said, gird up your loins, okay? And, and they would, they had these long robes when they wanted to do something fast, they would take their robes, tie them up so that they could run. So in other words, this is an urgency, okay? So it's like, we need to live God's way, this is urgent that we live this way, okay? That we deny ungodliness. We let go of the past, okay? We let go of worldly lust, okay? Because remember, um, we just need to remember about, um, it says in, um, to be in First John, I have to, I'm going through in different scriptures, you know, we have to be careful of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. That's what, you know, you look at sin, comes down to lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so we need to deny ungodliness. It doesn't matter whether we live all around it, we deny it. It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing all around us. Remember how Crete was, okay? They were lazy, they were gluttons, they were evil, okay? And they were liars. So these believers are in the midst of this, okay? And it's like, by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit working in you, you can deny this ungodliness and the worldly lust, okay? And you can live in this urgency like Jesus is coming again soon, okay? Which we want to say, come Lord Jesus, come, okay? And we want to live in right standing with God and we want to live holy because God is holy. So again, just to make sure we're saved by grace. Remember Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. So it says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. So by God's unmerited favor. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So first, the grace of God is there for us to be saved, okay, through faith. It's not about us. It's about a gift from God. Then verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we're not saved by good works, but now that we're saved, we need to do good works. We need to show what our father looks like, okay? We're supposed to be our, our heavenly father's children. And so now by grace again, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do good works. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works. 
Ephesians 2.10, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So then I have an excerpt from With the Word that says, God's grace not only saves us, but also teaches us how to live the Christian life. Those who use God's grace as an excuse for sin have never experienced its saving power, Romans 6, 1 and Jude 4. The same grace that redeems us also renews us so that we want to obey his word, Titus 2, 14. We want to obey his word. We want to live for him, okay? Now, I said Titus 2.14. Now we're going to actually look at Titus 2.14 and 13. And it says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. And, you know, sometimes they call us a peculiar people, zealous for good works. So again, from that line that I read, the same grace that redeems us also renews us that we want to obey his word. We want to be, we are Jesus' own special people and we're zealous. We want to do good works, okay? Because of that power that works to us, because of that grace um, that's given to us. Now, the other thing I want to bring up is you'll notice in this lesson that, um, first of all, here it says, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So notice hear how they say Jesus Christ, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But one of the things that you'll notice in this lesson, you keep seeing Savior. And this is important dealing with the people in Crete, because again, they had false gods, not the Cretan believers, but there were false gods all around them. And even in their literature and their poetry, they would call these false gods Savior. So they had to come and say, no, no, our Savior is Jesus Christ. God, our Savior, is Jesus Christ. And so they had to re-emphasize this. Paul was re-emphasizing this with um, Titus so he could emphasize it with the churches. So that, you know, I mean, again, they're in the midst of this and they've got to get the world out of the church. Okay. The, okay. How we say in the world, but not of the world. An ex excerpt from the Jeremiah study Bible says, these verses demonstrate the timelessness of God's grace. In the past, it appeared to all men when Christ was born into the world. In the present, his grace teaches us how to live godly lives. In the future, it will appear at the glorious return of Christ. For the believer, God's grace is inescapable. And praise God that it is inescapable, that we have this unmerited favor of God and we have this power to do difficult tasks by the power of hope, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our last verse in our lesson says, here's again, Paul talking to his son, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. And that um, reminds me of other places in the Bible where it says, let no one despise your youth um, when they were, um, but even whether he was young or not, we know he's a spiritual son, but he says, let no one despise you. You are the spiritual leader that I have left in charge of these churches. You are the pastor of these churches. He said, you need to make the corrections, rebuke where you need to rebuke. Okay. He says, exhort. So encourage where you need to encourage. Okay. And remember, you have the authority to do so. Don't be timid about it. You know, go ahead and handle it. And this just reminded me of 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, when he was talking to his other son, Timothy, and he said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, right? So they talked about sound doctrine in this lesson. We have to have sound doctrine for reproof, for correction. We talked about that just in that rebuke with all authority for instruction and in righteousness, okay? So they need to learn. They got to unlearn what they've been living in okay, and learn instruction and righteousness, that the man or woman of God, I'll put that in, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, okay? So he told them, you got to speak these things, you got to exhort and rebuke with all authority, and don't let them despise you, stand up, stand up, you know, just stand up. 
So just to end this lesson, this is an excerpt from Word and Life Study Bible called the Genuine Item. And one thing about Crete, they said they actually were manufacturers of jewels. And there's a place in um, Titus, and we're going to be in Titus next week too. So it's going to be to be continued because we're going to be in Titus the third chapter next week. But it says to adorn that they should adorn themselves. Okay, but that adornment is basically or to look like we're supposed to look for God. So like we're a beautiful jewel for God. Okay, and that we're genuine, we're authentic. Okay, so we're twenty four karat. Okay, we're not fake. Okay, we're not counterfeit. So we're being authentic, we're being genuine, and we should reflect that attractiveness of God, okay, as this beautiful jewel. And they understand that talk because they were jewel manufacturers or or they, they dealt with jewel. But it says in this excerpt, as we read Titus, we need to ask, what are the poets of our day saying about our culture, Okay. What is the moral reputation of our society? Mm. What is the spiritual climate? Like the Cretan believers, we need to speak the truth and live the truth. And you know, everybody always say, not your truth. Okay. You know how people say, I'm living my truth. Their truth might be like them Cretans and be Cretans that weren't believers and just be lies. Okay. Okay. It says, we need to speak the truth and live the truth. Okay, and Jesus Christ is the way, the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. So again, like the Cretan believers, we need to speak the truth and live the truth. When people look at us, they need to see authentic Christianity, not a lukewarm, accommodating lifestyle that stands for nothing. We need to make the gospel attractive in such a way that unbelievers will be drawn to the matchless. And you think about that beautiful jewel and the light that comes off of it, light of the world. And that light of the world is Jesus Christ. So this is our lesson for today, rules of life, okay? That um, we need to live, okay? We need to speak the truth and live the truth, okay? And we need to live soberly, righteously and godly lives, showing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is our lesson for this week. Be blessed, love in Christ, Sister Sharon. Mm -hmm.